thank you for the opportunity to come and talk about what lies ahead for NHS providers. And I should say, uh, the NHS providers I'm talking about, the 240 NHS trusts and foundation trusts we deliver acute ambulance, community and mental health care. We've got about 35 minutes together, and in that time, I'd like to talk about three things. Firstly, what's the current context that these 240 boards of providers are operating in? So with respect to the finances, performance, regulation, and workforce, what's your current situation? I don't like spending a little bit of time talking about the next five years, the future context, the new government priorities, and the five-year forward view. I'll probably rattle through that material a little bit quicker, because Nigel's done it, and Nigel will have done it better. Um, but I do want to spend a little bit of time at the end, in this third bucket, talking about how do you respond. If you want these 240 boards, and you've got this challenging current context, you've got challenging future context for the next five years, do you respond as an individual institution, like you always have done? Or do you respond as part of health companies? Do you wait for the answer from the Department of Health and monitor the <coughs> on how you get more efficient, how you deliver better patient care, how you do strategic planning at the regional level, or do you form those structures and those answers yourself? And finally, what implications are there of the challenging current and future context for the leadership task if you're on the board of one of these 240 providers? So I hope that works as a structure for the talk. Uh, before we get into the detail of the current context, I just want to say uh, what the overall mood music is as we see it, and we try and capture this every six months with a picture. The picture at the moment is, well, things are coming a little bit clearer, but there's been this, this sense of just stasis, not just during Perda, but even before that, if you're trying a reconfiguration, if you're trying a new care model, the message coming back was don't create too much noise, keep the noise down in the system for a while, let's see what happens, don't make any plans. And now it really does feel, if you talk to providers, that there's a sense of being out of the starting blocks. All these plans have are on hold, suddenly feel turbocharged. It feels like the centre monitor TDA, NHS in them, are really gaining grip on what it means to deliver 22 billion in efficiency <coughs> savings, what their task is, whether it's the action we've seen on agency staffing recently. There's a sense that things are happening, finally. Um, so that's slightly positive, more, more positive new music than we've had in the past. So let's get into the detail. And, um, I really hope there will be some optimism at, at points in this talk. It won't be in this stage because we're going to talk about NHS finances. And it's a really, really simple equation. If you've got activity, that's fine with that. If you've got temporary staffing at premium rates to cope with that activity, if you've got cost improvement plans that are underdelivered, and you know they're going to be underdelivered at the start of the year, one community finance director, I asked him what his um, Cost improvement plan was for 15-16, he said it's snapping pencils in half. So that's, you know, that's really funny, what's your cost improvement plan? He said, I'm not kidding, I haven't got one. I've got last year's plan, and I did it back 70%, I'm just rolling it forward. And then obviously if you've got tariff efficiency and blocks cutting the revenue, you add all of these up, and you get destabilizing provider finances. So there was a point in 12-13 when, remember that, you made a surplus, 593 million pounds, you can reinvest that in patient care, talk about capital projects. We felt 108 million deficit in the previous financial year. In the financial year that's just finished, 822 million pound aggregate deficit for 240 NHS trusts and foundation trusts. Vastly overcrowded. If we continue at this pace, we're looking at 2.1 billion, as Nigel was very slightly leaving my property behind. I do apologise. Because it's not, well, that's probably the most interesting part of this talk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're, looking, we're looking at a 2.1 billion aggregate deficit by the end of the next financial year, uh, by the end of this financial year, sorry, if, if things continue at this pace. And the even more worrying thing is it's not a case of the worst getting worse, which has always been the case before. So we used to go to the Treasury and we have these conversations over what are we going to do about providing finances. And these are three sigmoidal curves setting out surplus deficit for each individual provider. So each bar is an individual provider. And it used to be, if I'm looking at the left-hand side of the chart, there'd be a, a handful of the 240 who are in deficit. And you could look at that and say, PFI, 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 health economy meltdown, financial mismanagement, PFI, PFI, PFI. And even to a certain extent, you could do that in 14, 15, but there were a few good DGHs that, that were being pulled into the mix. With 1560, international teaching hospitals with diversified income, shelf and group trusts that you thought will never, you know, we're forecasting 
10 years of sustainability, now suddenly tipping over to the extent that 60% of the provider sector was in deficit last year. 80%, uh, just under 80% of acute hospitals were planning for deficit. And with the Treasury now, the discussions are, are boards giving up? So that's what they're worried about. They're worried that there's no stigma anymore to being in deficit, and there is no stigma to the size of your deficit. What does it matter if you're 8 million pounds in deficit, because someone down the road is 10 million pounds in deficit? And that's creating a really, really hard dynamic, even with clinical engagement. So there was a, clinician, a meeting of clinicians and general managers, and the GM was trying to say, look, we, we've got to get more efficient, we've got, to, we've got to do all these continuous improvement practices. And the meeting was quite stormy, and it ended after three hours with one of the clinicians getting up and saying, do you know what? We've been bust this year. We're going to be bust next year. We were bust the year before, and the trust down the road is bust. So I'm going to keep admitting patients and doing what I'm doing, and walk down. That's not typical, I would say, but that is a struggle we're facing with the efficiency agenda when it almost gets so hard that you risk giving up. And if we look to the future, um, Richard Douglas always used to have a magic sofa. He was the Director General of Finance in the Department of Health, and whenever winter <coughs> pressures would get really hard, there would be an extra 100 million or 200 million pounds that he would find down the back of the sofa whenever you needed a capital project. And he was joking at his leaving due that his magic sofa was being removed, that everyone sort of laughed, and then again there was a sobering moment where we realized, no, he's not kidding, there is no more money, there is no more magic sofa. And there's still a lot more questions to be answered over this eight billion pounds that we're gonna get in a steady state by 2021. Is it gonna be front-loaded, is it gonna be back-loaded? Is it dependent on tax revenues and spending cuts, or is it independent of that? We are looking like we'll get a three-year spending review, not a four-year spending review, and not a one-year emergency review, so the government does have this flex in the outer years, depending on what tax revenue does. But the clear message coming through is, you got what you wanted. Taxpayers have put their hands in their pockets for an extra 10 billion for the NHS, so you got what you wanted. And that's putting us in a challenging position, because senior leaders in the NHS just don't believe that we're gonna save the 22 billion. 10% are somewhat confident, none are very confident, that we will reach 22 billion pounds of efficiency savings by 2021, under the current paradigm, under the current paradigm of year-on-year, in-year efficiency savings and a focus on technical efficiency rather than allocative efficiency. And so that's a dangerous dynamic. When we talk to the Treasury, they just say, you got everything you wanted. You asked for two billion pounds in the autumn statement, you got it. You asked for eight billion pounds by 2021, you got it. If you should have asked for more, that's tough. You got what you asked for. At the same time, the other government departments are being cut to the bone, squeezed until the pip squeak, even if some of your money is going to be used to cross-subsidize social care. So the dynamic is, as the Treasury, we do not see why the NHS is such a bottomless pit. No matter how much we give you, it just gets sucked up and any store falls over each year. Why can't you be more like local government? Why can't you be harsh in your decommissioning? But the overall message is, deliver, 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 because there's no more money for you. <coughs> And that's tough, because unlike many of the other government departments, we are incredibly activity and volume-based. Um, that, that affects our annual managed expenditure. And activity is just going through the roof. We used to talk about winter pressures. This is a &E, uh, emergency admissions through a &E departments by week, uh, with the latest year showing a step change in orange at the top. And we used to talk about winter pressures. My favorite quote was from Newsnight, actually, where they said it's like Narnia. You've now got a perpetual winter without Christmas. And that's what it feels like. It feels like there is no break anymore, that the pressure, pressures are staying all through the year. That emergency care in particular, which is incredibly costly, as you know, has become magnetized. And so what's the solution? Well, part of the solution is increased scrutiny, especially on the quality uh, from, from patients, from staff. You've now got this this whole industry of regulation that has sprung up in response to, yes, incredibly shocking and inexcusable care failures, but also in response to just demand pressures and um, pressures against targets that are manifesting through uh, reduced performance against national standards. So the Morgan Bay investigation, another 44 national requirements on top of the 180 or 280 from the Francis review. So boards are increasingly reporting upwards and spending management time doing that rather than focusing on improving services. And when it comes to regulation, um, does anyone from Palmas in the room? No? Is this Chapman House? No, not okay. as such. Oh, well. I'm not going to get a job at Monte anyway, so I'll, I'll be honest. I wanted to do a talk 
uh, for non-executive directors. We do inductions. So, so I wanted to give you the impression that when it comes to regulation, it is risk-based. If you're in this high-risk category, we will be all over you like white on rice, quite rightly so. If you're in that top category, light touch. We'll stop by for a coffee every six months, see how you're doing. But we'll let you get on with it, earned or Tommy. This is the reality. I get a little ping in my inbox every time a trust is under investigation by monitor with the TDA for finances or quality. Um, this was four weeks worth. So we have a regulatory system that is still predicated on pockets of failure, individual errors of management, rather than system-wide pressures. So you're trying to apply an old model to a new scenario, which simply doesn't work. And this is on top of everything else, on top of special measures and success regimes and star chambers where, um, where, for example, as the chief exec of a billion pound trust, you are asked, do you have a grip on your system? Who's the any consultant on charge today? And the right response isn't, do you know what, I run a billion pound trust? Why should I know who the any consultant is? Do you think that's what grip and management and board leadership is about? That is the dynamic of grip harder to get our way through. And also some worrying news in terms of regulation of muddy and waters. So Mollet is stepping into the, into the development space. Um, and organizationally, we're agnostic on this. I, I have qualms about regulators stepping into the development space. CQC has always been very clear. We are an improvement agency, uh, not an, no, how did they phrase it? We're an agent of improvement, not an improvement agency. And it seems like a fine distinction, but they're very clear that there are dangers in marking your own homework in developing a 350-page strategy toolkit, and then asking boards, why didn't you use that when you were in difficulty? So I do have some questions about um, money and waters with the, uh, regulators doing more development. But if you'd asked me two weeks ago what my sense was of regulation, I would have said, I'm, I was concerned about the lack of the sense of urgency. So there's a scene in The Godfather where Tom Hagen and Robert Duvall on the left is, is out. He is, he is fired as a consigliere against the uh, the lawyer and advisor to the Corleone family, and asked why. And Michael Corleone says, you're not a wartime consigliere, Tom. That was my alpha human presentation. Who's good? I like to go. Yeah, you should go my dinner. But, um, but that was the sense. Right? Yeah, if you know. But that was the sense. That these are incredibly serious times, but you're applying an old model, and you're not taking any national action. I'm happy to say, so we have to say, that that seems to have changed. It feels like, post-election, that fire has been lit under the regulators, and there are changes in the approach, both positive and negative. So you look at stepping in to cap agency spend, stepping in uh, on refining the 18 weeks for filter treatment targets, making the CQC look at both efficiency and quality, again, there are risks and opportunities there. But this balance between support and intervention is, they're doing more of everything, but I do also worry about the intervention. So visiting 43 providers for two-day site visits to talk through your plans and, and do that second check. It feels very interventionist. At this stage, I'm just happy that that fire is being lit and they realize the scale of the problem they're facing and they're trying to change their approach. But what would really help, I asked a, a trust chief executive in special measures and I said, do you, do you get enough attention um, and support from the, no, do you get enough support from the regulators? And he said, I don't know about support, but I get lots of attention. And the one thing, he, he talked about a few things, it'd be nice if the regulators provide more national air cover. But he just, he just said, I need two boards. I need one board that responds to the regulators and assures people that things are okay. And I need another board that's actually running the trust and looking out to my local community and patients and governors and nets. So that is a challenge. How do, you, how do you reduce the regulatory burden without completely losing your grip? On workforce, Again, this has slightly changed, but the incredible, at one point we were planning for a 2% reduction in registered general nurses by this point. Everything has inflated uh, in the other way, whether it's CQC inspections. Um, I've said before, the CQC has two types of press release. One says you're inadequate or require improvement and you need more nurses. The other says you're good or outstanding, but you still need more nurses. That level of inflationary pressure, seven day services, the nice safe staffing has been paused, but for a long time it was, again, driving inflation in registered general nurses, and that hamstrings you. If you've been running a multidisciplinary model, if you've been involving pharmacists in care, the number of schemes that will suddenly grow back to say, we've got CQC coming in, we'll put more nurses on the floor. And overall, there is a worrying lack of strategy 
for the NHS workforce? What is the strategy? Boards don't know who's actually responsible for them. Is it Health Education England? Is it me? Is it the LEPI? And what are we planning for? What is the exam question you want me to answer? Is it just keep the show on the road now with regards to quality, in which case bank and agency, I'll keep doing that? Or is it plan for the future, in which case what I'm doing on bank and agency, I'd rather invest in district nursing. I'd rather invest in retraining of staff. And even at the Health Education England um, level, they're facing this challenge. They say we have a five billion pound budget. How much of it do you want us to spend on recruiting nurses from the Philippines? How much of it do you want us to spend on retraining your existing staff? So if we put that together, again, not the optimistic part of the talk, performances and finances are trending down. <coughs> the answer from the center is grip, tighter, grip harder, into being more. And there's still lots of unanswered questions about the fundamental issues of strategic workforce planning, how we do it for 22 billion, and what our regulatory approach to drive change should be. So let's move on to the middle section, which is the future. And again, I'll, I'll move through this quite quickly. I think Nigel already talked about the uh, results of the general election and what it means. I think the one thing, <coughs> the one thing that feels different uh, from conversations with Secretary of State's office is this sense of we've got five years to make a difference. Five years, time limited, focus on a few things and drive improvement in, in those uh, priorities. And these, these ideas are universalized the best. That's where you'd like to leave the service by the end. And, um, and also still this focus on technical efficiency. Everyone who goes to Virginia Mason, I'd like to go there one day, because everyone, everyone who goes comes back saying the path to safe care is also the path to low cost care. In terms of Simon Stevens, um, his directions become clearer as well. Um, he doesn't, he's not a fan of, I know three CCPs have just merged, but he's not a fan of structural reconfiguration. He doesn't see that as the way you do it for change. And he keeps just saying, okay, the system we have at the moment is not ideal, but if you act like it works, well, it's got a better chance of working. So work with what you've got. And he will be judged, again, thinking of legacy in the next five years. Did I blur the boundaries that existed in 1948? Does secondary care, primary care, community care, does it feel more seamless? And prevention. He's the first person that I've heard in a long time who actually really feels strongly about prevention and is driving it. Um, and he really is emerging as the NHS's Mark Hyde, that figure who does negotiate with the Treasury, who sits above the firmament and has that first among equal status for good or bad. So Nigel's talked through the new care models, I won't talk through them. Um, except to say that we're urgent emergency care, we've been part of this Sibiru's Kia review. Um, Sibiru's Kia obviously is excellent, but the review itself has been stymied and, and quite turgid for a while. You stick the word Vanguard at the end of it and release the Vanguard program, and suddenly everything feels turbocharged again. And that's my concern. I think the 29 Vanguards are going to do incredible work, largely because they're already doing incredible work and now just have to tag Vanguards after them. But I do worry about the specialization of of vanguards and, and I was talking to a GP practice who said we put in a vanguard bit and we're not back and it's really just not just back morally and not morally emotionally because we're we're questioning whether we've been on the right path for the last 10 15 years we thought we were on the right path does this mean we need to re-examine what we've been doing and on the other side I was talking to a community provider who said we've been an integrated care pioneer for three years we didn't realize this never saw any program, I the CCG had that. We've just been getting on with the business of integrating care. So I think we're putting a lot of pressure on these Pathfinder sites, on these vanguards, when really it's the whole distribution of the 240 that we have to find solutions for. And the other problem with the vanguards is, well, not problem, another potential issue with the vanguards is so much of it is structural, and behaviors trump structures. Uh, whether you're talking about simple MA, the, the phrase I was doing all the rounds during the Dalton review was merging two turkeys doesn't make feelings. And it applies to everything. Yes, we can integrate health and social care budgets, but if you merge two bankrupt systems, you don't get one financially viable. This excessive focus that structures are, are the issue. Now, my dad's an anesthesiologist. Anesthesiologists are still working in the same trust. You wouldn't think about it. It's like a lot of flies. So behaviors trump structures every time. So let's talk a little bit about behaviors, because I want to talk about if you're a provider and you've got this current context, you've got the future context, how do you react? Well, the first thing you can do is run a good tight ship. So we've got never events in the NHS. Secretary of State has them on his board. Um, 
www.saidvets.com. So vets have all these events. Just 10 things that should always happen in our trust. Examples of good care. And they just started out as a small initiative, they say, has completely changed staff engagement, staff morale. Because staff suddenly say, we're talking about what we should do rather than what we shouldn't do. Unexpected to some extent, but that's running a good tight ship as an institution. Same with Lancashire. How many trusts I've been to that say, oh, you know, the, they're not enough nurses, not enough nurses, not enough nurses, we're paying back an agency. Lancashire said, yeah, we can keep playing that game. Or we can partner with the University of Bolton and train our own nurses through a self-funded course. So they've now got a pipeline of nurses that are going directly to the trust. And the nurses are different. They always had um, allocated places with a high drop-off rate in that part of the country. They're now finding that the nurses carry through all the way through. They feel that, I can't remember exactly how they phrased it, but they say something like, the nurses don't feel like they work at Lancashire, they work for Lancashire. And Northumbria, make your own good luck. So that's their new emergency <coughs> care hospital in Cranlington. Um, and Northumbria did all the basics, they did service management. They had business units where the clinical directors spent 50% of their time on the shop floor, so they've got credibility, 50% of the time managing the business, being on top of their P&L. But they didn't stop there, just running a good institution. Negotiate with the local authority, buy out your PFI with a public works loan. Vertically integrate and now run primary care in your patch with two or three practices. And do this emergency care board. There is a surgery's cure review going on that will designate centres as major emergency centres, emergency centres, urgent care centres. And as a board, they sat down and said, do we wait for this review? Or do we just get on and do it? And they said, let's just get on and do it because then they'll have to make us emergency, uh, a major emergency centre. They won't have a choice because we'll be doing all the right things in the right place. It's the same thing like Julie Moore says about the National Programme for IT. She could wait for that, but they went on and developed the, developed the PIC system, which is just superb. But you've got to move from being a good institution to being a good team player. And that's what they're doing at Salford. So yes, Salford, golden, golden child, poster child for the NHS provider sector for a reason. So David's board could have sat there for years talking about our delayed transfers of care rubbish, social care rubbish, social care's been cut. They did something about it. They're taking over adult social care from the council for their patch. Again, you don't have to structurally do that, but you have to do something rather than just complaining about social care and how you're doing your bit of the pathway and other people aren't doing theirs. Because that's, that's the journey we're on. It's absolutely what one day says. We had the century of the physician with their black bag. We're coming to the end of the century of the institution, and we're now going into the century of the system. And that requires different behaviours and different ways of thinking, especially when it comes to money. So there is genuine income that comes into the NHS. Taxpayers pay their money, <coughs> um, and it goes into the Treasury. They allocate it to the Department of Health and DCLG. That flows into the NHS and to commissions. There is genuine spend by the NHS on drugs, devices, staff, kit, things. Everything in the middle is internal market transfers. So why does it feel like a win when my friends in commissioning say, do you know what, we really screwed the provider over in this year's contracting round? And why does it feel like a win when my friends in the provider sector said, the commission is trying to drop our prices, that we're off tariff, we're just going to boost activity so we're revenue neutral. And why does it feel like a win, you know, even the nerdiest finance directors, and I've met, you know, nerds, that off the chart. You walk into the office and you're doing algebra within about five minutes. Even they say, this is not why I've gone to the NHS. I'm going to talk about quality and service redesign and how, as a finance rep, I can make that happen, not the bean counting side. So we need to break out of this and get into a whole system here now. But it's really hard. It's really hard. Even within the private sector, that alone between providers and commissioners. So Healthier Together um, is a review of specialised services in the Greater Manchester area, where they're basically doing service swaps. They're saying we can keep the patent provision as it is, or we can redistribute it so you know you get better as you do more. So let's put vascular surgery in one place. Let's put um, renal in another place. I'll give up something to gain something. And when they were doing this, uh, a very senior NHS figure went up to hear the proposals and said, this all looks great. Business case stats are absolutely the right thing to do. The problem is, looking around this table of chief execs, one of you is going to blink at some point because your institution is going to come off worse than the others, and you're going to take a hit. And at that point, you're going to want to walk away, which to some extent has happened. They're slowly coming back to the table, but it's really hard, because everything else is set up on the institutional sovereignty level. 
the unit of regulation, the unit of performance management, the unit of money is all in the institution. So systems behavior, risk sharing across providers, is, is very, very hard. But some trusts are, are managing, so part of England is obviously um, in some trouble. But one of the good things they did is break out of this cycle. They said, they sat down and they and said, we've been, we've been doing this for about five years. You find me and then give me back the money. You get non-recurrent funding partway through the year and give it to me partway through the year when I splurge it on whatever I can buy at that point in the year. Why don't we just agree all the money that you would have taken off me and given back and all the money that you would give me mid-year and just fund me for growth. Give me 2% growth every year rather than playing the game. And I'll invest that more wisely and we'll have a different relationship. There'll be a risk pool in case activity goes too high. If activity goes even higher than that, then I'm on my own. Almost like a block class. But that's run across all our service lines. And this is actually from the commissioner saying history will judge whether it's a success or not. At least we're trying to do something different. And we're doing commissioning now, not contracting. Devo Mac, another opportunity to do something different. The staff we named Greater Manchester Strategic Health and Social Care Partnership Board. Um, the chief officer there was saying, I've got 37 leaders. 37 leaders on my board. That's how we're running it. It must be. One hell of a telecom, but that is what systems leadership means, to get 37 leaders in a room and have that distributed leadership start rather than one person telling you how it's going to be for Manchester. And that, there are risks and opportunities with Devo Mac. The one I pull out again is culture and behavior. So the classic, you know, it was the ultimate stereotype when the two finance director groups got together, where it was all cordial, and then one local authority finance director said, just shakes his head and says, Do you know what, I just don't, I've got to say it, I just don't understand. I've cut my budget by 35%. You guys keep your penny about 4%. I just don't understand why you can't make things go. Um, finance director of NHS Trust says, well, that's easy. Do you want me to cut my A&E department? It's easy when you're talking about putting potholes. Pothole repair. Local authority finance director says, if I cut my pothole budget any further, there are going to be more accidents and you'll get more people turning up to A&E. So this is the almost farcical scenario we ended up in. I'd have to say by the end of the meeting, there was, if that was the idea, things would grow back to a point where there's a bit more shared understanding. But there is a massive culture clash on the cards between how you decommission, what rationing means in a local authority context versus the NHS. And those two cultures are going to have to come together by 2016. But there are opportunities, if nothing else, for public health. Um, and again, I, I love beating the public health drum. And when you hear an acute finance director talking about, yeah, I'm starting to take an interest in public health because I'm going to start feeling pain in Manchester if things go wrong. And this is, this is from Mexico, um, where they, they did a few wonderful things. They uh, taxed junk food and sugary drinks and uh, hypothecated it for clean drinking water in schools. And then also had these things on the tube where they hyped up the prices and then you do 10 squats and you get a free subway token. I'm not suggesting necessarily we do that in London. I don't know how you got here. I got here on the central line. I don't want people doing 10 squats in the summer before getting on. But in this area, <laughs> you were doing citywide planning, and the acute bus is playing ball. Their skin is in the game, is what it felt like. Um, but moving on to the final bit, which is about leadership tasks. Because as Nigel said, the first big issue is this a bandwidth there? Is the management bandwidth there to keep the show on the road, delivery for our targets? of your crisis referrals and to transform, strategically transform. And even if that capacity is there, internally, do you have the capacity to deal with all the moving parts in the system? You know, these two things keep coming up over and over again. I'm never sure who to talk to about what, and I'm not sure what the locus of strategic planning is in my health economy if I want to do things differently, if I want to drive change. And again, to a certain extent, I, we've had two years of that. I'm a little bit tired of listening to it. Because there's some local health companies that are saying, no, there is no regional leadership, we'll create it ourselves. In some places, in Wiltshire, it's the Health and Wellbeing Board. In other places, like Manchester, it's the Council of Chief Execs of Providers. But do something, because the time for complaining is over. <coughs> so if there's a capacity challenge, there's also a capability challenge. Because we've been training provider leaders to do something very differently to what they need to do <coughs> now. Before, the challenge was run a tight ship. Yeah, get to FT status, run surpluses, be able to take the SHA screaming down the phone at you to do it for our time. Put up that chicken wire. And now 
you're, you're being asked to add things to your skill set, to deliver outcomes, to be part of the fleet, to be a systems leader, to give up part of your power <coughs> rather than playing the zero-sum game and trying to win it. So you get your, your dayhood or your nighthood. And we're asking people to look at capability in different ways, one in terms of what I, what I call be less gonzo and a bit more clever. So the gonzo the leadership style is, what well, doesn't have a leadership style, it's not really a leader, but it's all about him. It's heroic leadership models. If I take over another trust that's failing, somehow through my heroic leadership I can impart the will for you to be better at what you do. And what we need in this new system is more curtains, facilitated leaders who give away power, who train a cadre of people that can go off and take over and work together more collaboratively. More collaboratively. And the, one of the final things they need is optimism. So you, you talk to a board and you can just sense how much pressure there is on them, and just the level of deflation. And I do, I do these net induction talks, and you see them bright-eyed and bushy tail. And I run into them six months later, and that girl has gone through their eyes to some extent. But one of the best things I heard was a chair saying to a chief exec, what are we going to be famous for as a trust? And the answer was, we're going to be a world-class center of surgical excellence. We're not going to be the specialist cancer trust of the year. We're going to be a great district general hospital for frail older patients in our community. That is our ambition, but we're going to be world famous for it. So that is part of the leadership challenge, being optimistic, and also getting this, this sense of no one's going to come and solve the problem for you, so you've got to do it. And some FTs get that. They've had earned autonomy. They've been driving change for years. But other trusts are still looking up for the answers, and they need to move into this mode of what Stephen Dollars described. Just find a problem and fix it, and ask for forgiveness, not permission. That's what Northumbria did with their emergency care board. So to finish, um, what are some of the challenges and opportunities? As always, um, if, you've got, if you've got to pick on someone, why not pick on sales reps? We've done managers, they were last week. Why not move on to sales reps? We've got to demonize somebody. Um, so this war on sales reps that Jeremy Hunt has, uh, has announced. Um, the appetite for paying for innovation is a challenge. The appetite for innovation is huge. Genomics, you know, you talk to guys in St. Thomas, about their genomics program, their appetite for innovation is huge. The appetite to pay for innovation is small. Innovation has risk. Yeah? You've got to have a risk appetite. Like some things aren't going to pan out. We're going to bash molecules together and something beautiful will come out sometimes. But we haven't got that risk appetite. Or at least haven't married it up to our appetites. A non pay spend, if I see one more piece of price benchmarking, I, I might actually cry just because. It's, it's missing all the nuance, and we've got to talk about value rather than just rationalizing the price. Um, the opportunities, I've, I've probably seen more commercial announcement boards than I've ever seen in the past, certainly in the past 10 years. And it's not just from the people who are coming in. Yes, there are a lot more finance and commercial directors who are coming from the private sector, but the net the board, their appetite for doing things differently has never been higher. I think that burning platform really has started to burn, and they feel like we will be doing things differently and are also looking outwards to partners for new ideas. They've been looking at, at uh, a few pharma and tech companies and saying, we've been buying this for you for a while. We want to talk about how you do your logistics, because I'm interested in that as well. You must be doing something interesting that we can learn from. So that appetite to do something differently and to ask other people for answers is never been higher. And that's what's going to help us survive. So I know there's been a lot of pessimism in this talk, but I am an optimist. And before when people would ask, you know, who do you think of the 240, who are the 10 providers that are going to be left standing when it all goes to hell in a handcart? I would have said the Shelf Group a while ago. You know, big international teaching hospitals, diversified <coughs> established business models, big assets. I don't think that anymore. I think it'll be the trust like Yokel, the trust like Moorfield, where it's not about being the strongest, it's about being the most adaptive to change. Um, so I hope there's some optimism in there, and thank you very much for your attention.